Ryan here with Dark Rangers Inc. And I want to wish you guys all a happy holidays. And it's that time of year at the end of year or the beginning of the next year where we tend to reflect on the previous 12 months and look back. And I wanted to do a video on my key takeaways from 2023. Now, hopefully these are takeaways that will stand the test of time. It'll be interesting to come back next year and see how I feel. But I feel like in the last 12 months, specifically in the last six or seven since really kicking off the channel, I've learned more about this hobby than I have probably in the previous several years combined. And so I wanted to share some of those takeaways with you. Some of these will apply not only to increasing your astrophotography skills, but to a variety of hobbies or skills that you might be participating in. I've been fortunate in my life to go to a pretty high level or even be competitive in several other hobbies or sports. And so I'm taking 39 years of my learning lessons as I barrel towards a midlife crisis and sharing them with you guys. And so hopefully you can sit down and take a break from your loved ones and get a little distraction here on your favorite YouTube astrophotography channel, or at least one of them. So I wanted to take a little break from the holidays and give you guys something to enjoy while you relax with your loved ones and maybe take a little break and escape into your own little world for a second. So let's kick it off with number one. And this is gonna be probably the least sexy and enjoyable one to hear. And I am gonna save the best for last, but the first one is gonna be patience. Now, some of you guys have already clicked off of this video because your social media brain kicked in and there wasn't enough stimuli hitting your eyeballs and you've already left. And so you're missing out and you don't even know that we're making fun of you. But for those of you guys that's still here, you know that astrophotography while it is fun to stack that data you got from the night before, it really is a patience game. The more time that you can put into an image, the better the results are gonna be. And one thing that I realized is when I was new, I wanted to just stack everything that I got and see the cool image that came out. And that was really fun, but really quickly, I realized that getting one amazing image in a month was a lot cooler than maybe getting three or four okay images. I don't like to put out work that I know is substandard when I know it's just a matter of putting a little bit more time and effort into it. A big thing that I look at when I think about this topic is the time of month that I shoot at. So I look at the 28 day calendar for the moon as basically having one good week that's kind of the new moon plus or minus a few days two okay weeks, and then one really bad week during the week of the full moon. So if I start an image during that good week, I usually don't wanna finish it on the bad week. So if I'm not able to get three or four good nights of data during that new moon week, I typically will put that on hold or on pause and then finish it the following month. I know sometimes this can be painful because, oh man, I've got you know 10 hours of data and I just wanna stack it and, and get it done. But adding full moon data to new moon data to me just just doesn't seem like it's hugely beneficial. Now you might be saying, well, Ryan, do I not image on a full moon? Absolutely. I tend to pick targets that are gonna be a little bit more bright, specifically narrow band targets. Specifically, I do try to target more of the HA or S2 signal because it tends to be a little bit stronger, but I pick brighter narrow band targets that I know can handle a little bit of dilution from the light coming in and the new moon. And you know, I, it's probably not gonna be my most favorite image or most important Important target for that month, but I do image any clear night I can. I just kind of try to keep the data at the same quality level. So I don't take all this great new moon data and then add a bunch of junk because then you kind of get the garbage in garbage out philosophy. And I think sometimes it can do as much damage as it can good. So patience is a really big one. The other thing that is also important is the altitude. So if you look at the amount of signal you're getting when a target is let's say at 30 degrees or below versus up over 75, degrees, it is pretty dramatic. And you can actually see like a perfect signal to noise uh, curve as the night goes on. And so I do try to target images when they're over 45 degrees and kind of relatively within the same time during the lunar cycle. The second one is going to be the fact that there's no one right way to process an image. I go at every single image differently. And I know that I do have a framework out. I do have a one shot processing and an narrow band guide. That is just 
just a framework for you to kind of use. I use processes on some images. I don't on another. I do them at different time points. It all depends on what I'm trying to do. Dynamic background extraction in Graxpert is a great example. Sometimes Graxpert totally ruins an image. If you look at certain data for some reason, it just totally messes it up. Sometimes it does a great job. Sometimes dynamic background is a good option. Sometimes not doing any background modelization or cleanup is the best because the data comes in clean and you're going to do more harm than good to some of that faint signal. It all depends. SPCC is another great example. Uh, if it's a narrow band image, I tend to steer clear of it because it's not really optimized for that. Uh, and sometimes I don't like the way that it comes out. I like the way it looks without any color calibration. So it all depends on what you're going for. Rather than trying to memorize a set workflow, I think it's much better to understand the concept and what each one does and experiment along the way and figure out which ones really matter and which ones don't and realize that just because you've done that for several other images doesn't mean you have to take the exact same steps. I'll see people say, man, when I run this color calibration technique, I really don't like the way the colors come out. I like the way the colors look without running it. What should I do? <laughs> to me, it's really simple. Don't do it. They get so stuck on this workflow and doing things the right way uh, that they get lost in it and they'll take results that they don't like just because that's the process they're used to following. Now, don't get me wrong. There are fundamentals that should apply to every image, but don't let it hold you back from creativity and don't accept results that you don't like just because you think you're supposed to do it the right way. Be flexible with your process. Make sure you understand each one and what each step does so you know that sometimes you don't need to do it. And I know that's easier said than done when you're new. When you are new, it is good to follow a pretty strict workflow while you don't fully understand. But experiment with each process along the way as you're imaging and see what does it look like when I do this? What does it look like when I don't? What does it look like when I change this setting versus not? That's when I'm learning and growing the most is when I'm actually experimenting with my own data. So don't be afraid to try new things, which brings us to point number three, and that's about blazing your own trail. You don't always have to follow the status quo. I am doing my best work when I am taking my own data and I'm experimenting and I'm not following along with some YouTube video um, or some workflow. I'm taking the fundamentals that I learned from those videos and then I am experimenting and trying my own thing and I often get results that I wouldn't be able to get if I did it just like somebody else. If you do exactly what someone else does, you'll get exactly what they get. And so if you want to come up with something that's new, unique, and creative, blazing your own trail is often a good idea. Now, you, again, don't want to stray too far from the fundamentals. This doesn't mean to go crazy, but it's okay to try something and see what comes out. It's okay if it doesn't look good, and it's even better when it does. I post stuff even when I know it doesn't look amazing because it's something that I wanted to try and maybe somebody else will like it. You don't have to come up with the perfect image every time. Perfection really is the enemy of the good and you want to try new things so that you can find out what you do like and it's just as important to find out what you don't and you're not gonna do that if you do the exact same thing that everybody else does or that you're doing every time. So don't be afraid to blaze your own trail. Number four and your post Christmas wallets are gonna love this. Effort is more important than equipment. Now they're both important, and if you have effort and equipment, you will get the best results. But once you hit a certain level of equipment, I would rather take mid-level equipment, I'm talking, you know, a decent Petsful or a triplet APO and a decent, you know, mid-level Astro Cam or mirrorless camera, and having the effort and time to go to some dark skies and getting more integration time than the best refractor and the best camera camera under less ideal circumstances with less integration. I do think that the setup with more effort in that situation will beat out the better equipment unless they also put in the same effort. So a lot of times if you are looking to increase the quality of your astrophotography images, you don't have to do it with dollars. I think we get so caught up in this gear acquisition syndrome that we assume the 
only way to get to the next level is if we buy another piece of gear. And I'm telling you, you can get dramatically better um, by just putting in more effort, taking some of concept one, adding some patience and improving your processing ability, as well as the ability to get out under darker skies and collect more of quality data that you can stack to ultimately get a better image. When we look at our astrophotography contest, the scope that won it was one of the cheapest in the entire competition, but that single panel had more integration time than any other single image. We did have one that had more total time, but it was a mosaic. So they won not only on the look of their image, but it was really the effort that they put into it. Really high quality processing, a lot of integration time, and it was not even close to a result of having the best equipment in the contest. Number five kind of goes along with number four, um, and that's using all the tools available to you, but pretend like you don't have them. So what does that mean? Software and processing can often have a bigger impact on your astrophotography images for a lot less money than buying new gear, but I almost want you to pretend like you don't have those tools available. AI is a great thing, I'm all for it, but you'll hear me kind of moan and groan sometimes when it comes to the subject because I feel like when people lean on it as a crutch, it causes them to lower their expectations and standards on what they get into the camera. The most important thing you can do is get good data onto your imaging sensor. I have no problem with AI and I would recommend that you use all of these tools unless you say to yourself, well, you know what, my guiding's not that good, but I know that this new sharpening tool can fix an elongated or even a small star trail. Or, you know, I don't have a lot of data, it's gonna be kind of noisy, but I can just use a lot of noise uh, reduction software and get rid of that in post-processing. That's when AI can be detrimental to your overall image quality because in the case of elongated stars and bad guiding, don't lean on the software, go out and actually fix the problem, get to the root of it, don't lean on the software, because guess what? If your stars are elongated, sure, we can fix them and make it round, but that also means that all the detail in your nebula and galaxy is also gonna be soft and blurred. Think about if we blew it up you know, to the size of a large poster and your star was this big and we make it this big. Think about the nebula, it'd be the same as taking that data and smearing it that same amount in whatever direction your guiding was off, and that's what's happening to all the other details in your images. It's not just the stars that are elongated, all of the details are. So you don't want to lean on that. So what I say is, go ahead and use it, but when you're actually imaging, pretend like you don't have that available and get the data quality that you need to get a good image without that and let that be the sugar on top. All right, concept number six is that less is more. And this is really going out to all my intermediate uh, and occasionally to the advanced astrophotographers out there. And the reason I say that is when you're new, you struggle so hard just to get something stacked and put together that looks anything like a target that you'd see online that your images end up looking fairly natural. They look kind of close to what they do straight out of camera because you don't know how to add a ton of saturation and contrast and vibrance to the image. So they do look very natural. And then folks that are more advanced tend to kind of go back to that point, but they just look much cleaner. The intermediate phase, when you finally learn how to really use all these processing tools and bring out the color in detail, we all, and myself very guilty of this, tend to take it too far and we have these crazy images. Now the internet doesn't help because overprocessed images tend to get a ton of love online, but I think all of us have seen those finely crafted images that really lean on the data and are processed just enough to showcase what's out there, but they don't overdo it. And what really kind of rounded the corner for me on this was a couple images um, where I had done them originally under a different palette, and then I redid them, and one was SH2, 115, and 116. And I originally did it under a 4X palette, kind of like an RGB 4X palette for monochrome, and there actually was good data there. I just way over-processed it. This is when I first learned GHS, and even in my GHS1 video, 
video, I overprocess and overstretch the clamshell uh, and bat nebula, even though it is one of the highest performing videos that I have. But I did say that in the video, I am going to overstretch this just to show you guys for the sake of the video how far you can do it. So I did at least have a disclaimer, but with SH2115, when I did this, I really wanted to just let the data speak and I took it into Photoshop and it's almost harder to not overdo it than it is to actually punch it and make it more contrasty and colorful. And I was worried that when I posted it, even though I liked it, it wasn't going to get a lot of love online. People were going to think it's kind of boring and it was just going to fly under the radar. And I couldn't have been more wrong. I posted it on the ZWO forum at the time, which, you know, typically you see between 20 and 50 likes on a pretty good image. And it was the first one that I ever got over 300 likes on an image on that page. And a lot of the comments were specifically around the processing and how it wasn't overdone and it was subtle. And so that really cemented to me, it's really about getting good data and letting the data speak and not over processing. It's really cool once we learn how to do those tools. For those of you guys that have been in the hobby for a while, you do know that less is more and letting the data and the image speak through what's actually out there versus you adding a lot of artificial color, detail and saturation ultimately leads to the best results in most cases. Number seven is gonna continue the build on the previous statement concept, and that's don't care what people think. So I think a lot of us have all been in a situation where we've maybe held ourselves back because we were worried about what other people think. Now this can apply to astrophotography or anything in life, and it's easier said than done. We've all heard those people that say, I don't care what people think about me, I do my own thing. And we all know that's BS. Every single one of us, to some extent, cares a little bit about what other people don't. If you aren't, you're like a psychopath at that point. So congratulations. We are social creatures. We're built to take affirmation and give it, receive criticism and feedback, and it changes the way we feel about something. And so as hard as it is, I want you guys to express your creativity and do your own thing. And even though I said don't overprocess your image, if you need to overprocess your image to realize that it looks better to not do it, then go on that that journey. If you need to go through that phase, I encourage you go through it, enjoy it, have fun, go crazy with your processing and then realize, hey, I know how to do it. And now I know how not to do it. You think about the trained fighter, right? They learn how to fight so that they can learn how not to fight and how to have the self-control and discipline to avoid that situation. It's the same thing with this. If you need to go that route just to see how good and how far you can process an image, so at that point you know you can always dial it back, then I say go for it. If you want to keep it subtle and do your own thing, if you want to try a completely different color palette that you've never seen anyone else try, Go for it. Who cares, guys? They are digital pixels on a screen. They can be erased. It doesn't cost any money. You're not taking these to a printer. They are not uh, determining your outcome in life. You're not being paid for this, hopefully. And so just have fun with it and don't be afraid of what people think. Try new things. Most of them aren't going to be good, but every once in a while, you will come up with something that no one else has done because you weren't afraid of what people thought and you came out with something that's really cool. So don't be afraid to continue to do that. And for number nine, it's give back to the community. So we touched on this a little bit with the feedback. Give feedback, uh, give advice, give help. If your friend posts something cool on social media, share it to your story. Put a thoughtful comment, like it. Give them the praise that you love to get in return. If you see a question being posed on, you know, Pix Insight for Beginners or Learning Astrophotography, answer it. Don't admonish people for asking a question. Give them the same help that you needed when you were in their spot. The whole reason I started this channel was because there were so many things that I had to learn by piecemealing five or six different videos together, asking questions, having people kind of make me feel like I was stupid for not knowing it and even asking it in the first place. And I said, you know what, when I learn this stuff, I'm going to put out a video so that I can help them not have to have the same struggle as me. And so if you go back, 
back to Picks Insight for beginner forums specifically because that's probably where I'm the most active. You'll see that there were questions that people were asking and I'm like, I'm just gonna make a video on that. So then the next time somebody asks, I would just copy the link to my video and paste it and that way they could get a direct answer for the question that they were asking. So that's why I came up with the channel was to give back what was so freely given to me from previous astrophotographer YouTubers and all the people that have helped me online. So if you see a question posed, take the time to give a thoughtful response. If you have a screenshot or an image that can help or you have a video that helped you, if it's mine, if it's somebody else's, copy the link, take the time to help out your fellow astrophotographer. And the worst thing you can do is make somebody feel stupid for asking a question. We've all probably been there, myself included, where we're just like, man, that's a stupid question. But they don't know the answer. So try to help them out, give back to the community. What I love about this hobby and this channel is we have an amazing community in here. And I love the opportunity to help you guys and to make your astrophotography journey better and I know a lot of you guys do the same. We have a great commitment to each other. So go out of your way to help a fellow astrophotographer because guess what? It helps you become better as well. If maybe you have to do a little bit of research even to help them get the answer, you might get to that answer much quicker than they are because you know more of the background. And then guess what? You just got a little better as a result. And finally, number 10, and I think this is the most important one, and it's really on the flip side to number nine, is don't be afraid to ask for help. One of the biggest reasons I started our Patreon community is because there are other hobbies that I'm still active in, and I have so many questions, and rather than try to piece together 8 million different YouTube channels, it would make my life so easy if I could just go to an expert and say, here are my five questions. Can you just help me answer these? I've actually offered to pay several astrophotographers before creating this channel, like, hey, I will pay you for one-on-one -on -one time. I have these four or five questions. Will you help me? And they were like, here are some resources. Go check that out. Well, I don't want to watch a four-hour Picks and Sight video to pick out the two or three answers that I need to find. I just want to ask the question and have somebody be able to answer it. So whether it's me or somebody else, pick a source that you trust Action. and don't be afraid to ask for help, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's joining their Patreon community, whether it's creating a community of your own. A side note to this point would be pick a couple people, one, two, maybe three tops and listen to them. Whoever it is, find somebody whose work you like, who communicates in a way that's effective for you. What I see so often, I have people come to me and they go out to the internet with a question, they get 50 different answers and they come back more confused than they did before they started the journey. And then they trust me, but it's almost like they're kind of arguing with me. Well, this person said this, this person, that, this person said that. Well, my answer in the back of my head, I don't ever say this because I want to be polite is, well, then go work with them because if, if you trust, and I know what they're doing, they're just saying, well, I heard this and you're saying something different. So why are they saying this? And you're saying this. And the answer goes back to several of our previous points is because everybody does things a little bit different. There really is no one right to, way to do a lot of these things. And so I would really recommend is to find a mentor or two and really stick with that person. I don't care who it is. It certainly doesn't have to be me. There are people that are smarter than me and there always will be. But but find somebody that you trust and really dig in with their community, with their group, and really understand where they're coming from. Because trying to get answers from 10 different people is exhausting, it's confusing, and it's only going to slow down your progress. But it's still better than not asking for help at all. There seems to be this bravado or pride a lot of us have that we feel a sense of accomplishment for doing things the hard way. They see asking for help, maybe getting a one-on-one -on -one lesson, maybe buying a class as something that is not, you know, I want to learn it on my own. Well, nobody's learning this on their own. You're either, whether you're figuring it out inefficiently by trying to go to 10 different sources online, or you're doing it efficiently by picking a source that you trust and just go Going with them, you're still learning it from somebody else. None of us are really totally figuring this out on your own. So let the ego go, leave that at the door and pick one or two people and really get the help that you need. Because I'm telling you, you're going to look back and you're going to say, man, 
I've been doing it this way for so long and this person showed me this way and it just saved me a ton of time and answered all my questions. Don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. I'm telling you, you will thank me in the long run. People that get really good at things quickly realize very quickly that it's much more efficient to find somebody that really knows what they're talking about, that they can trust and just work with them. Well, there you guys have it. My top tips and takeaways for the year. When I started this channel, I really didn't have an end destination in mind. It's been a wild ride. Thank you guys for all of your kind comments and support. If you are new to the channel, Channel, please consider subscribing and as long as you guys continue to get value out of this I will continue to try to make regular content for you guys each week Let me know what you want to hear and let me know what your biggest tip and takeaway not only from this video But just from yourself and your own personal experience Leave it in the comment below and guys have a great rest of this holiday season and a happy new year and as always clear skies <laughs>